How do how do I pronounce it? Am I is it Dr. Danny Homer? Homer. Homer. Yep. Okay, so the way that I met you, just so people kind of have a background, is my mom has had issues with, I mean, pretty much just her posture because she sits at a desk. Right. And uh, so just kind of explain to people what you guys do because Injury Peak Solutions, that's where you work, right? Peak Injury Solutions, yep. Peak Injury, I'm, I'm doing it wrong. Uh, so, so what is your guys' practice for people that don't know? So we diagnose and fix scar tissue. Scar tissue is a very common underlying cause of a lot of musculoskeletal, so tendons, ligament, bone, based problems. And people get it, people, uh, uh, other doctors either don't know about it or they misdiagnose that with a lot of things. So it gets confused a lot. So people have these chronic unresolved injuries. And what we do is we um, evaluate and diagnose the scar tissue component of it. We can fix that and then that resolves the injury for them. How do you identify the scar tissue? So, like, how does that process work? So what you do, we always start with a history. So our biggest, um, uh, let's see, what am I trying to say? Our biggest priority at the beginning of any patient encounter is diagnosis. So we take a very thorough history. We have to decide that if it is musculoskeletal or if it's being caused by something else that it could be. Because let's say you have headaches. Well, if you have headaches and you sit at a desk all day, it would make sense that it's coming from like the base of your neck mm -hmm. and the skull and that posture. But let's say that you have, are having so much caffeine that you're actually getting like a kickback from that. We have to decide if um, even just based on the history, does it sound like it's a musculoskeletal thing or does it sound like it could be like a chemical thing or like something else going on in the body? Um, like my husband has found breast cancer before anyone else has found it in a patient just because when he was putting the case together, it just didn't make sense in how you load a joint and unload it. So that's one of the things we think about, first of all, is, okay, does this look musculoskeletal? If that lines up, then we'll roll into the exam. So what the exam consists of is very specific functional ranges of motion for each joint. So it's like we have a test for each joint in the range of motion. So if you have like shoulder pain, we look at, you know, is your neck causing it? Is your mid back causing it? Is your shoulder causing it? And based off these scores or based on these um, tests, we have a score. And then we look, so let's say your shoulder hurts. Your neck's functioning at 40%, your mid back's functioning at 8%, and your shoulder's functioning at 70%. Of those three, we look at the worst score, and then we usually go and fix that test first. Mm. So it's one of those things where just where, you have, where you're having a symptom can be misleading about what's actually causing it. So we're always looking for the root cause. So that's um, through some specific tests that we do in the office during the evaluation process. Then after we see what's not working the most, we go in there and actually palpate or feel the tissue. And um, a really good thing that you can think about is healthy tissue should feel like the pad of your thumb. Mm -hmm. You squish into it. Yeah. So then that's like what, a cushion almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It should feel kind of like a, like for steak people, it should feel like a fillet. Like okay. it should feel nice and squishy and very tender. Now, if you bring your um, thumb and your middle finger together and you squish into that, you can feel that it's a little firmer. Yeah. So that would be like mild to moderate scar tissue, and you're looking at more like you know, a denser cut of meat, sirloin, or something like that. It's just not as tender. Then if you bring your pinky finger and your thumb together and you feel into it, it's like not budging at all. Yeah. That's what moderate to severe scar tissue is going to feel like. You're assimilating that more with like the uh, gristle of a steak that you just can't cut through. Yeah. So that's what we're feeling for in the tissue is how much that tissue bounces back and just what the texture is of it is. So... I guess, does it just depend on the severity of people? Like, what's a general timeline to fix scar tissue? You feel like if you've had scar tissue that you never identified for years, that would take a lot of work to finally re-get, like, massaging that thing to come back and be fully functional. So that's the thing is that there is going to be layers of dysfunction. We kind of describe a lot of injuries like a dysfunctional onion. Mm -hmm. So the core of the problem is in the middle of the onion, just the layer back the problem. And by the time someone gets to our office and they're like ready to get it taken care of, it's you know been annoying enough to like take up some bandwidth in their brain. Yeah. They they usually compensate in a few different areas. So that's why you like the shoulder, for example. Well, like 
your neck probably started it, in, for instance, in this one. So you, I'm sitting in this posture. Hey, <laughs> little dude. I knew he was going to make an appearance. Um, <laughs> and so over time, your shoulder gets beat up from always taking that load. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where we usually have to go through layers of dysfunction in the tissue itself and then clean up some you know, other compensations that have been going on for a while. What what's some of the most common like scar tissue injuries that you see is a lot now since we have moved to like a digital age where people are sitting at the desk it's more like the neck issues where they just they can't fully like have the range of motion that they normally would like they're just not activating that part of their body or so that's kind of a twofold question so um, we see a ton of low back because low backs get loaded a bunch when they're sitting right <laughs> uh, actually sitting loads the discs in your back compared to lying down 300%. Really? So that's a lot of pressure that we get and we sit, we have a very sedentary world compared to, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but yes, necks and backs, between uh, computer use at work and then going home and slumping in front of the TV or being in front of, in front of a cell phone, backs get it really bad. Yeah. So. Um, I'm sorry that he's such a distraction. <laughs> I mean, people are gonna laugh when they see him. I think he's done now. He's like, I've. Or you don't want anything. We'll else. see. Seven months old wants to do everything. Right. Yeah, no, I wanted to bring up like lower back pain because that's the issues that I seem to have. And I'm 23 years old and that really worries me because I feel like I'm an old man. And so then I recently learned about the sciatic nerve mm -hmm. and how, I, and that, I think that's the issue with me. But like, is it a structural thing? Because I've always had issues with my right ankle and I was wondering like, if over the years everything's being overcompensated, because it's it's the right sciatic nerve, it's not the left. Right. But I've always had lower back issues, and like two or three years ago, when I like started lifting uh, in the gym, I was really putting on a lot of weight. I was kind of mm -hmm. like a meathead. That was the mentality that I was operating with. But it got to the point where I tweaked my back, mm -hmm. and then ever since that injury. It's never been the same. And then I can think back again, like I said, with my knee and my ankle, it's always been the right side. Like this ankle, I've sprained I don't know how many times when I was a kid. So I, I would believe that there's probably some permanent nerve damage. And then that's like, you know, this leg has to keep up or do more work than this one does. Yeah. So that's where it can get really complex. Yeah. What talking about. So let's start with the ankle itself. So what happens when um, there are different ways you can accumulate scar tissue? So one of the most common ways and the one that people are most familiar with is from blunt trauma, where you actually go in, you rip the muscle from an accident that you like can't control. Yeah. Like, uh, kind of like a freak, freak event, you know? Um, so what happens is that those fibers do get torn. Your body will go in there and will put a bunch of scar tissue down in a haphazard pattern to seal it up. Kind of like when you break a, a you fracture a bone, it gets it goes in there and there's this matrix that gets put in there to, to heal the bone up. Same thing happens with your muscles. The problem is, is that a lot of times we don't allow for proper injury healing from that process. So you have some um, little, what am I trying to say? They're called macrophages. It's like a recycling unit cell in our body. It will go through there and it will clean up the bad scar tissue if you give it time. A lot of people though, as long when your ankle quits hurting, they start walking on it and yeah. returning activity. So anytime you tear something, it's going to take four or six weeks to heal. That's what your body is going to do. But usually by two, three weeks, people are like, oh yeah, I feel good, so I'm going to go do that. What happens, you don't allow it to heal the whole way, and then it kind of turns to a snowball effect where it will get a little more scar tissue and a little bit a little more. So then what happens is that your ankle stops moving, so now your knee has to pick up that extra slack. Yeah. Well, your knee can only do overtime for so long, so then it recruits your hip, and then it recruits your low back. So that's how one of those like chain effects works, right? So you're Over right the on years, it. yeah. yeah. Now, now I'm seeing like how where I'm at is this position at 23, feeling like because like this sciatic nerve pain, it's oh, okay. Maybe I should. Hmm. I, I was about to say excruciating, but like sometimes it's not as bad, and I'm, right. I'm able to go. But like I haven't really, I haven't touched legs in the gym. I've not done a leg day in like over a month. Um, it's hard to play basketball. I was trying to shoot basketball or just shoot hoops last night and I can shoot obviously because that's my arms right and I have a base that's under me but it was hard to like make cuts or anything like it was I would kind of like wince in pain when I make that cut and then I work at COC and we help people that have disabilities so a lot of times you have to pick them up Definitely. out of their wheelchairs and reposition them and uh, I'm just thinking like okay this has been going on for like a month now like how am I gonna get out right. of this? 
And so a question that popped up in my mind when you were saying all that, is this just like misinformation from the scientific community? Like, did we just, because you said four to six weeks right. for a typical recovery, but people are like, oh, I feel good at two, I get back out. Right. Like, what happened? Why, I mean, why does it get worse and worse and worse? Right, so the scar tissue thing is uh, a multifactorial. So um, if you're familiar with like inflammation, free radicals, antioxidants, all that kind of stuff, mm. At a cellular level, that's how scar tissue will accumulate. So that's the other, there's two other ways that it can accumulate. So it can accumulate from overuse, where like let's say you decide you're going to train for a half marathon, and you have this um, schedule where you don't allow for a lot of recovery. Well, every time that you do go through and you know um, strengthen a muscle or exert it, it is going to create micro tears depending mm -hmm. on level activity. So if you just don't give yourself proper recovery, those micro tears will fill in with scar tissue and then long term, it will start to create that scar tissue formation that again, snowball effect where yeah. there's a little bit in there, you don't get it, you don't let, allow it to heal and clean up, a little bit more will happen and then just over years, you get a big thing. Um, and then the third way is just from constant contraction. So this is like sitting at a desk for eight yeah. to 10 hours a day. We just weren't made to sit and be stationary like that. We're dynamic humans, we were meant to hunt and gather, mm -hmm. you know. Get up and move. From even like a hundred years ago, we had to, you know, our whole day was filled with movement and activity just to survive, yeah. just to get food and water and shelter. And now, you know, we have a lot of luxuries in our lives, so we are a lot more sedentary. Um, and so that's the other way, is just assuming a posture all day long is really hard for our bodies. So it, something you forget, you know, right. to, to constantly tweak your posture. I can even tell, like, you, you got good posture, obviously. I'm like, dang, I'm slacking. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I watch people on the other end of it all day. So what happens in that contracted state is that if you're always contracting those muscles, um, that blood flow decreases. And then if you don't have good blood flow, you don't get nutrients in there, free radicals form, and then that's what can create that scar tissue at a microscopic level too. Do you think also, like I had this thing happen to me yesterday, so I got out with my friend Mitch and we rode bikes like first thing in the morning, we did 10 miles. Mm -hmm. And I'm a person that in the gym, maybe it's because I do too much lifting, like I'm not doing enough cardio or anything, but I don't, I very rarely get a sweat going when I mm -hmm. work out. We got a sweat doing 10 miles. I mean, it was cold, it was chilly in the morning, but then later that night I went to the gym and I worked out and I had more sweat coming out of my pores. Do you, do you think that that's something like, if you don't use it, it kind of like gets all clogged up and stuff? Like that, that's my theory is that since I started the day like that, yeah, it kind of, it, it opened up everything for then when I went to work out. I honestly don't know enough about that to give you a no. inconclusive answer. Um, that would make sense. I mean, you do detoxify through your pores. So yeah. I do, do know one thing, like when I drink more water at the end of the day, I feel thirstier the rest of the day. So it's kind of like priming the pump. It could be something similar to that. Yeah. I don't know. It was just weird. Cause I was like, it gave me the feeling that I had when I first started lifting, like I would sweat all the time. Yeah. And it kind of, I felt like I had more energy in the gym too, which was weird. Cause I started the morning eight 30 riding the bike, but then I didn't go to the gym until like six 30 at night, but mm -hmm. I still had like energy in the reserve tank. So just talking about how people become so sedentary, I wonder if you started your day out moving, you know, that, that, that energy would transfer with you for the long haul the rest of the day. I just know that I, um, so we recommend for all our patients a 10 minute morning walk. So what happens overnight is that, mm. and a lot of disc based injuries. So that's basically from your tailbone all the way up to the base of your skull. Um, those discs, what happen overnight is they get fuller since you're not against gravity. So you're against gravity all day. Gravity puts its wear and tear across your spine your disc size will start to decrease, especially as you age and those discs wear out. So what happens in the morning for a lot of people is that when they get older, they're like, oh, I'm getting old because they feel a lot stiffer in the morning. So what happens is that those um, discs swell overnight, which is actually a good thing because it brings hydration and nutrients to the disc to repair it. Mm -hmm. But as a result, it, you wake up and it's stiff because your joint can't move as well as it did before you went to bed because it's a little fuller. So if you get up and do that 10 minute walk first thing in the morning, it'll push some of that inflammation out and you'll actually feel a lot better. So a lot of people that have had chronic injuries, um, degeneration, that kind of stuff, if they start their day off with like a 10 minute walk, it seems so simple and people are like, how much of a difference it can make? Man, it makes a huge difference. So I think yeah. getting moving in the morning is an important thing, especially for people who like you, you know, have to do a lot of studying and sitting all day, mm -hmm. or even, you know, if you're just like doing some more sedentary things at your jobs. Well, I, I, 
I really am a firm believer that the way that you start the morning is pretty much how you're going to finish the day. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, like if you start your day at a desk, it's like, it seems harder to get moving. Like that's what I've noticed is if I have to get up and instantly do homework, like yeah. it just seems hard to get up, up out of the chair. So yeah. Um, do you advise people on top of like getting their 10 minute walk in the morning? Do you also talk about stretching? Cause what if they're pretty sore and it's the, they can't even like get the legs moving to go on a walk um, or is the, that more for like advanced right the process walk of the treatment is always going to be priority because it will get your blood flowing it will get those discs moving and then after you get through your walk you'll see what's actually tight versus what was just like inflamed or kind of like you know just needed some movement from being in bed for eight hours yeah so i always recommend stretching afterwards um and a lot of stretching too um a lot of people do stretching routines like when they come into our office they have like you know this whole stretching routine and it's like i've curated this over years because i can't find anything that works what happens is um actually i'm gonna bring this in now is that scar tissue accumulates in the muscles so you won't actually need to stretch as much after you get that scar tissue out so like healthy muscle stretches like this nice and uniform everything stretches the same um and then when you get that scar tissue in there it acts like glue. Mm. So you can see at that place where the scar tissue is, it doesn't move at all. And then you actually start to get strain on the ends of where it's being pulled extra because the middle part isn't moving. So a lot of people um, that come into our office have like one of the hallmark things that we look for actually is that they do well with massage therapy, they do well stretching, but it just never lasts. So yeah. they, when they get in there and we get that scar tissue broken up with our hands or an instrument, um, that breaks that muscle free so then it can stretch easier like this instead of like this and then they won't have to do like you know their stretching routine gets cut by like you know two-thirds because what they're doing is just working around that scar tissue all the time yeah so well because there, there's people that go to like the chiropractor but you know I feel like you have to continuously go but that doesn't even like I've been going to the chiropractor for years mm -hmm. but like you know I still got I still got issues i still got back pain it's still been a problem that entire time like right. it just seems like temporary relief like we're not actually getting to the base of the problem and fixing it yeah you're right and that's honestly where i was um back when i was going to chiropractic school i was getting bad headaches and um i knew they were tension source like they came in the back you know the through my shoulders up to the base of my skull and it was from you know long uh, days of studying, being in school, going home and studying after that, you know, it was a regular schedule, a lot of stress involved. I was actually night grinding during that time too with my teeth. Um, but I would find that adjustment would last like one day. And it was kind of scary because I'm like, um, spending like, you know, $200,000 to learn how to do this skill, but it's not fixing me. And I'm only, you know, 23 at that point. Yeah. And so, um, another student in the clinic had been taking some of these soft tissue courses and started treating me. And I mean, it was pretty haphazard. It wasn't like, you know, the primo treatment that we offer in our office, but it was still giving me like two or three, four days of relief in between adjustments instead of only one. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, we're onto something here. And you know, I, like I said, I was making a substantial investment towards education and my profession. And I was feeling a little hesitant about it. If I, you know, if I couldn't have my own problem solved via those same techniques. So that's when I started looking at the soft tissue. Um, but yeah, it just, it just makes sense that if the, you move the bone somewhere and it doesn't stay, then you have to fix what's, you know, moving the bone, Yeah. which is the soft tissue, the length, the tendons, the ligaments and the muscles that surround that joint. Is it, uh, I'm thinking for myself again here with, uh, I, when I first went to the chiropractor, they do like the x-ray or whatever, they mm -hmm. kind of analyze your posture and they told me that like the middle of my spine was twisting to the left and then one of my shoulders was lower than the other. Uh, I think my hips were out of alignment too, which I think is normal if you haven't been to the chiropractor in a while, but is there any way in your guys' practice that you're able to uh, almost like reverse the curvature of a spine? Yes. So let's... Back up. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really good question. So one of those things that with x-rays... Um, x-rays are just really, uh, they're like black and white TV and there's not a lot of information you can grab from them. If you have a, if you're suspicious of a fracture, um, or some kind of cancer growth or like substantial degeneration, 
An x-ray is good, but it's only two-dimensional, so it just gives you one angle, and it's black and white. So you can't tell what else is going on there. An MRI is really the gold standard for any kind of musculoskeletal um, problem. The bad part is, is that those are expensive, so yeah. we don't resort to those until later stages. It's also That's a whole other story because um, we could get them done for cash price, like $200, $250 in Florida. Here in Iowa, they're 700 cash price. So it just doesn't, you know, that's like, that's a whole other conversation that yeah. I don't have a lot of knowledge about, but it's like, makes me sick. Um, here or there, MRIs are, like I said, like a high def, like TVs that we have now, where like you can see so much more, you can manipulate it, you can look at it from a 3D angle. And a lot of times I see that people's um, MRIs or x-rays show up with nothing on them. And then you get the MRI and it's like, oh, there's a lot more here. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things with the reversal of curves and stuff like that, that can be from positionally. So, I mean, not saying that people are positioning people in a way that it would reflect that, but you can. I can put you in a position to take an x-ray and tell you that's the right position right. and make it appear a certain way versus an MRI, you're laying there flat and it's just a three-dimensional model. Um, so... There can be some user error with x-rays, um, but also what you're seeing is compensation the body's made. So like I talked about, like if something isn't working, a muscle will shorten up on one side in order to protect a joint. So that's where it's like, you can't take a lot from an x-ray and say, this is concrete because x-rays positions could change day to day. Hmm. There's just not a lot of like substantial evidence and not even, I don't want to be in that research field because people are like, where's our research? There's not research for a lot of things like that's good. It's mm -hmm. bought and paid for it by someone. So here and right there, um, there's just a lot that can be um, subjectively interpreted from an x-ray yeah. and it's not necessarily objective. So it's just not as cut and dry. Do you get a better understanding of a person's uh, spine by the posture? Over, yeah. over uh, Go, going uh, through those going through those joint by joint approaches because people can't cheat through that stuff like yeah. I will put someone in and I'll ask them to position and I will try to guide them through it and they can't physically go through that you know that for that person that is a problem for them so it's like it's just a lot more custom to go through these joint by joint approaches and looking at range of motion in a um, very small facet and then globally you can see how they're moving too but it's really important to go to the actual joint See how that joint is moving individually if you want a um, picture of what's going on in it, you know, the entirety. Yeah. So I just, uh, based on what I've seen from school, we did a lot of x rays there um, because that's kind of what the chiropractor's best tool is as far as diagnosing. Um, but the range of motions that I do and I fix now, I get far better results subjectively and objectively. Um, in those, you know, relying on those measurements. So do you, do you not even do x-rays of people? Have you aban abandoned that approach or did you ever use that when you first started out? I rarely use it when I first started out. They actually, it's kind of fun, funny, um, as far as the chiropractic field goes, um, the radiologists in the field don't want you to use them unless you are suspicious and you're trying to confirm something. And that's not posture. Now, the philosophical branch of chiropractic is very reliant on x-rays as a utilization tool for um, diagnosing. Mm -hmm. But, so that's where it's like, even within the chiropractic profession, at a collegiate level or like at an education level, they can't agree that x-rays are a good or bad thing. Like, we, yeah, so... Why are they still around then? Well... Are they, are they really that effective? Like, it yeah. seems like there's some disagreement or there's some... There's right. some overlap. There's some confusion about it. Exactly. Um, so that's why I didn't uh, I didn't go down that avenue because I was more interested in the soft tissue, you know, even before I graduated school. Um, and I relied a lot more on the hands-on tools to diagnose a patient than I ever did on something that's kind of static and one time over. So th describe your process to me and how because were you when you went to school you were going to become a chiropractor but then you found this or am i wrong so by degree i am a chiropractor you are i just don't treat like a traditional chiropractor okay. like in probably any respect um i just found that i want i'm very analytical so i want everything to be cut and dry and chiropractic can be very gray fluid area because you have some chiropractors that you know believe that you know, there's one 
very um, eccentric person on the internet that said that if they would have adjusted like the Columbine um, students that they wouldn't have, you know, had a mass, uh, done a mass shooting. Like, some part what? of it, yeah, right. What? So like you have people on that spectrum. It's a strong claim. Right, right. So like that's kind of like how far the profession can reach and kind of why I decided to segregate myself a little apart from that as far as like, you know, putting forth that I do something totally different. I don't, I, I am a chiropractor. But I'm, I don't approach people with them a chiropractor because then they automatically assume that they know something about me. Mm. And that I do something so completely different that it's like, I don't even want them to be on the track that I'm a chiropractor because then they're going to be like, oh, I've already been to one and I hated it. Or I already been to one and I love my chiropractor. And those are emotions. They're not, yeah. they're not like based in fact. Right. So I just always open up conversations that I treat soft tissue, I treat scar tissue and stuff like that because the people are automatically curious, like, well, what does that mean? How does that, like, what do you do? Yeah. And then there's room for me to explain what I do differently than just saying I'm a chiropractor. They already go into conversations over right, right. there. They exactly. walk out the door. Right. Do you think that's worked in your favor? Like that you, you've had a lot more people come to you? Yeah, like, because people are looking well and people are looking for something different. They just don't even know that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I see patients in there and like, for instance, um, I had a patient recently, she came in for a shoulder injury and then we start talking about stuff and she gets headaches and she's had a scoliosis and just a lot of these things that are under, you know, under her radar where she has accepted that that's going to be part of her normal life and that she that's not what she needs help with but then we went through ranges of motion and I can I'm like I can understand why you're getting headaches and I can understand why you've been told you have a scoliosis and you know we fixed her shoulder up and now we fixed her neck up and I'm like how your headaches been well, I haven't had any so it's one of those things where she had just resigned to the fact that she thought she needed to go to the chiropractor every month or every week I don't for the remember. rest of your life right and it's like no it doesn't have to be that way so, yeah. Do you, once people, like, what, like, when do you know that the scar tissue is, like, fully repaired? Is this just, like, a feeling that you get? Kind of like, I, I guess, maybe just an example to give it, like, a whole different perspective. Is like, you know, you're in a bad relationship. You break up. It takes months for you to finally get, I mean, you, you have that aha moment where you're like, you know what? That pain doesn't hurt anymore. It's like, I've thought about it so much and I've come to the conclusion. Yeah. Like, it, once they're treated... Do does it take years of coming back to you, or like once that scar tissue is like fully repaired, are they just they're they're done? That really, uh, it I guess really that was like two different questions. Yeah. So, what maintenance looks like is di different for every single person. It really depends on their lifestyle. If you're gonna eat potato chips and drink pop all day and sit on your couch, you have to get cleaned up a lot more because of that yeah. free radical process. If you have substantial degeneration, you're in your fifties. You're going to have to get cleaned up a little more often. Now, if you come in and you take care of yourself, you drink enough water, you get enough movement, you eat a rel you know, an 80-20 diet. 80% of the time you're eating something that's health-promoting, 20% is junk that everybody enjoys, um, and you don't have degeneration, you might need to clean up once every three months, once every six months. It's something where it's like, yeah, we'll go in there and clean up some stuff, but it's not going to be as you know much upkeep. So that's just really dependent on each patient. And, you know, some people just want to come in and they don't, you know, they're going to have frank conversations with me and say, I don't want to do these exercises all the time. And I say, okay, well, if you want to do your exercises at home, I can see you every two months. If you don't want to do your exercises, I'll see you every three weeks. And that's kind of one of those things where they make that decision for themselves. And I, you know, I can't make people do things outside my office. And yeah. some people are just, you know, like, they're like, I don't want to take up that mental bandwidth every day. That's, yeah, it's hard to get people to be motivated. But I mean, I think that if you've taken the step to come in, you acknowledge that it's a problem worth need, you know, needs to be fixed, then you're going to take care or whatever, you know, the person that's helping you tells you, hey, this is good for you. You would think you would listen to yeah. that advice. But I mean, like I know people, this is completely different, but like there's this girl that I work with and she's on like antidepressants. And then she said, she's like, I, yeah, I just didn't take them for a week. I'm like, well, why are you on them then? Because right. they're supposed to help you. Right. I mean, you went to the doctor, you know, you're not going to get better if you don't take them. But, I mean, I feel like some people, they just prove to their subconscious that they don't, they don't care about themselves. That's, 
that you nailed it. So have you ever heard Jordan Peterson? Yes. Okay. Yes. Have, have you read the uh, Twelve Rules for Life? Yes, I have it. Okay, so he talks about. Up on my corkboard, I only have five of the rules, but I was gonna finish putting the twelve. But take care, That's take so care of someone like you, would, like they were, or take care of yourself like they were someone else. Like that's one of his rules. He yeah. talks about how people take better care of their pets or others because their self worth and their yeah. self love is so low. So there it is, right there. Like a lot of people, you know, this is like really meta. Like I'm very intrigued by all these things, but it's human nature to be self-loathing and, you know, have amorphous issues and that's layers of trauma, generational trauma. I mean, like this gets into some real deep stuff that like, yeah, I can't understand. Um, and for me, it's like, I have to see these, I have to see people that have, you know, sacrificed their health in order to get ahead, in order to have more money. Um, you know, a lot of different things. And it's just when I see people like that all day, it makes me prioritize my health. Like, I've just seen the other end of it. Mm. And I'm, I, I'm a, I don't know if you're familiar with Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies. Mm -mm. I'll send that to you. So there's different kinds of tendencies people have. So I'm an upholder. That means that I uphold external expectations and internal expectations. So if I tell myself I'm going to drink 100 ounces of water a day, I just do it because I uphold that. If you were my doctor and you're like, you need to drink 200 ounces of water a day, I'd be like, okay, I will drink 200 ounces of water a day. So I have a really easy time um, upholding expectations, internal and external. Now there's obligers, which are the biggest chunk of our society, and they don't uphold external or they uphold external expectations but not internal mm. so they will only do things if they're held accountable by an external force if they tell themselves they're going to get up early and go work out at 5 a.m they won't do it but if they have a trainer waiting for them at 5 a.m they will do it so it's that's a whole other layer of things about that's, why people yeah, do things that's very psychological right there right so that's the thing is that a lot of i mean that's a the problem we run into a lot is that um I mean, I can tell you so many things. Another book that my husband really likes is The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. And it just talks about how the nature of what humans are, like uh, the good and the bad. It's cool how those topics or those books could almost help you in any profession. Right. Because you see this. We're mm -hmm. humans, right? So, like, right. we all, I mean, we vary differently, but we also have the same aspects that make up our personalities, the reasons that we make decisions and whatnot. Right. And I was just thinking, like, do you think if we didn't have, like, as much as social media technology has brought to us, like, thank God I have these because I wouldn't be able to put out my podcast if I didn't. Right. But if we didn't have these things that made us so sedentary, do you think that people would have an easier time sticking to these uh, goals or, or things that, you know, are going to benefit them even if it's hard to get started? I think, sadly, we, and this is another thing that's come up recently, we live in such an abundant time and age um, you know, we have people that are hating on America, and this is, I'm not trying to be political, but people that hate America and think that, like, it's an awful country, and it's like, have you been to a third world country? Yeah. Like, we would pretty, We're so privileged. Yes. <laughs> but and it's made us, like, we're not weak. appreciate. We're weak because of it. We too. are. We are lazy and we're weak because we have so much abundance around us. And that's why I think one of the things is, is that people just don't have to work hard for stuff as much anymore, like, us, the, as a general population. Yeah. There's still people that are high achievers, yeah. hard workers. Those people are still out there. But just as a as a whole, we don't have to work very hard about for stuff anymore, so we don't think that we really know what struggle is. We misconstrue what struggle is in modern-day life. I think that plays into social media because so many people have gotten accustomed to that instant gratification mm -hmm. that, like, even if you have... Like, you know that you're in trouble and you need to fix this thing and you want to get started. You, you can't see, like, that this is going to take a long time and there's going to be a lot of hard work involved. And I think that's where people get messed up because we have these deep reward systems in our brains that, like, when we do hard stuff and we conquer it, I think there's a sense of... Um, accomplishment and I think that's where happiness resides too like a lot of people are doing things that challenge themselves and I think that, that that's the hard part is like they're so used to getting whatever they want at their disposal like I can go look up anything I want on my phone mm -hmm. I can go connect with Facebook and you know whatever it is you know whatever your vice is but I think that's a vice for all of us to some degree yeah 
Well, that's what we call the Amazon effect. So people um, in our office, um, you can go to some treatments and it's like, you feel better instant, inst instantly. And some treatments people do feel better with, you know, with our treatments. They're like, wow, I can notice a big change right away. Not everyone, especially if you have, you know, longer degeneration or like you have more degeneration, um, it's a slower process, but you don't get that instantaneous Amazon effect where it's like, oh, I feel great. Yeah. And so people don't want to stay on the long haul because they're like, well, I don't feel better overnight. And it's like, yeah, you've had this going on for 15 years. Did you really think that one treatment was going to do it? And if one treatment could do it, I'd be charging a hell of a lot more than I do, you know? How, how do you approach people like that that come in to see you in your practice? Or do you get frustrated? Like, do you have to give them a pep talk? Do you have to get very, very stern in your mother voice and say, hey, bucko, yeah. it's time to hop on the horse and get to work? Oh, That'd be frustrating. It is frustrating. Um, one of the questions I just asked them is like, I ask them deep emotional uh, questions because that's where it's like, you know, people are like, oh, I don't want to take care of it. it's not bad enough. And I'm like, okay, well, what if in five years you can't pick up your grandkids? How would that make you mm. feel? And then people are like, oh, right. You have to, you have yeah, to go so you for have to it strike sometimes. a nerve, yeah. Yeah, um, because no pun that's, intended. that's the reality. You have to paint the picture, you have to future pace on. That's another thing that we um, do is paint the picture of what life is going to look like if they don't take care of it now because everybody is so short-sighted everyone wants fixed yesterday but people don't think into the future um so just helping them future pace like the reality is like you can't for stay in for more than a half hour right now how do you think that's going to be in two three years you know yeah. two or three years ago you could stay in for four hours yeah so if you can only stay in for a half hour now like what do you think that's going to look like and when you just it's almost uh i've been i listened to some therapy things like uh, um, women talking, you know, just about therapy. And when you just bounce questions off people and they have to actually critically think about the, in their, their own shoes, it brings a lot of clarity to the situation. So you, it's just staying curious is the main thing. It's, and it's, but it can be very frustrating. I think, I think you play a dual role in your profession as not only, okay, you don't classify yourself as a, um, a chiropractor, but you know you're working on like musculoskeletal provider, yeah. Yeah, but then you kind of are like a therapist in some no. way to ask these questions to make people really think. And I think that if you do ask those questions, you know, well, like when you're really listening to somebody talk they, and you ask them questions, they'll tell you anything. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that's why therapy works so much, you right? Know, because they're at the therapist's role is to ask them those questions and make them think about you know all these things that are probably right. affecting their life in a negative manner. And I also think, like you said, it's good to have negative motivators. Like, you got to look into where this could ultimately lead to the downfall of your life. Because that's scary. Right. You, have, you have to know the negative outcome if you don't correct your actions. Well, and sadly, uh, my husband's actually lived that, through that with his dad. So his dad started out, um, he was a basketball referee. So very active, mm. run up and down the court. I mean, most guys get a good workout in when they're doing that. Yeah. And he started with, like, a knee problem. And this was as Matt was graduating, uh, or probably in college, going to chiropractic school. Started with one knee problem, got a knee scope. Knee problem continued, got a second scope. Knee problem transferred to the hip, got a hip, uh, you know, surgery. Ended up, like, I think that he ended up having oh, five to seven surgeries, don't quote me. Um, before he ended up being on pain pills because he was just incapacitated, like he was in so much pain. Um, and unfortunately he ended up overdosing on those, um, not necessarily overdosing, but, um, he fell one night in the middle of the night when he was on the pain pills and ended up biting his thumb off and like, yeah, just not wow. a good, right. And so wow. he ended up sitting or lying in the grass, um, or on the back porch, I should say for like six hours before anyone knew he was there, wow. you know, passed out. So it's really near and dear to Matt's heart and he can actually get very emotional about yeah. it in like an intense way where Imagine. he wants people to understand, like my dad didn't think that it could happen to him either. You don't think that one scope is gonna turn to a second, is gonna turn to a next surgery, the next surgery, and then your only option left is opioids. And like it's Which are no, highly addictive. And it's no secret that those are a problem. I mean, like, yeah. when the national news and, like, the government is talking about a crisis and, you know, in the world, 
Um, when they're acknowledge acknowledging that that's a big problem, um, you know it's a really bad problem because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's problematic that gets you know skirted Swept under. under the they, yeah, there, well, there's only so much we can you know have as like a, I don't want to say clickbait, but there's only so much press you can bring about certain problems. Yeah. And so when something becomes so you know so large that it's taking up national headlines and it's actually a legitimate concern. Like that's the thing, you know, there's so much, there's so much quick fade out there, but this is a real problem for our um, healthcare system, especially in musculoskeletal me medicine. So that's where, um, you know, the heart and core of his practice is that he doesn't want this to happen to other families. I mean, it was devastating for him to lose his dad at, when he was only in his, you know, late fifties. Yeah. So. I mean, shit, that makes me want to, <laughs> Correct my issues right now. I'm 23, but like if I don't take care of it now, it's right. a lot worse. Yeah, and no one wants to think about that. Yeah, I think you need to though. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm I gotta ask you, how did how did you come across Jordan Peterson? Because Jordan Peterson is normally he he his audience tends to be men, particularly young men. My husband. Really? Yeah. When did he find him? How did that all work I'm out? I'm not sure. He introduced me to the Twelve Rules of Life. Um, and I read it and I was like, yeah, I love this guy. Yeah. And, um, it's funny that you say that, that his audience is very, um, you know, younger men. I just, and this is going to be a blanket gender statement, but men are to tend to be less emotional, more objective. And like, you know, yeah. uh, Jordan Peterson is very, um, intellectual and analytical. And I think that, that, that probably that demographic does suit him well. Because it gets into emotional overlay, but at the root of it, it's very objective and analytical, and I'm just a very objective and analytical person. Yeah. So um, I tend not to be as emotional as some females, or yeah, you know, yeah. I just I don't go to emotion. I always want to step back and look at it objectively. Which and you know, because he he used to talk about the different differences between men and women, because he is a psychologist, and mm -hmm. a lot of people get alarmed at that statement, but there are differences. Right you know, to some degree, but yeah, it's just interesting because most of his followers, and I don't even think it was intentional, it's just the information that he's putting out there, uh, young men have a hard time finding purpose, and he talks about responsibility and putting your life together, and like, I mean, I'm just going to speak to myself, like, young guys are hungry for that, they are yearning for that, but that is not what society teaches us, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of these misled places or gratification or pleasure that we're following based on what our society our society says is right or like being PC politically correct. I know this is getting way far from the topic, but <laughs> I think it's important to know. I, I just thought it was crazy. Like my face lit up when you told me that you listened to Jordan Peterson. Because he I think he's one of the reasons that you know I started like putting my life together slowly in inches. Like he talks about, I think, is it in the book where he talks about a little about bit better each day? Cleaning up your room? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's well, important. he just says, imagine if you got 1% better each day. Yes. And like that doesn't, it's like, mm, what can 1% do? But then you like look over a whole year, it's like, oh, that's 365% better than you were at the beginning of the year. Yeah. So no, it's an, like, I love a lot of things about him. Like, as far as just the, it's just the kind of the, the bounce back. Like you talk about like in therapy, it's like you just bounce things off people. And when he just says stuff, it makes me stop and think. And I'm like, wow, that's mm. like incredible. Like, you know, we're just like, we're talking about how we're overstimulated. We're on autopilot. We aren't aware of some of the things we're doing. We're talking about caffeine before and how we don't even aware, you know, not, we're not aware of the effects of caffeine. And it's like, once you have to stop and think about things, you're not on autopilot anymore. Life gets a lot better. Like when you stop and don't just accept or make assumptions. Yeah, because then corrective measures can be taken. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that we're bringing this all up because that's the idea that I started to think about. Like uh, the month of October is no social media month for me. Okay. Um, each month since June, I've done a monthly challenge and they get increasingly harder each and every month that develops. And I, I, I'm not bad at tech or checking social media, but I just, don't, I don't think it's good, you know, cause there'd be some days where I'm just sitting there and just scrolling mindlessly. And I think anytime you do that, that's, it's just, for one, it's not productive. It's just like, really, what are you accomplishing? And I, I, I think you have, and this could apply to anything that we've been talking about. I think that you have to psychoanalyze your motivations for doing things. So I realized, you know, now that I got this new apartment, I've been here for like, two months, it's good that I got a cat, but I, 
I was kind of lonely and I right. think that I was going to social media or like, you know, I would check Tinder and Bumble because I'm lonely. But really, is, is that a good motivating factor to be going on there? I think it's it should push you in the other direction to right. talk to people in person. Right. So I was like, you know, I gotta get off of this. Mm -hmm. And it can only help. And I mean, you know, so many people talk about the benefits of it. I think happiness increases, your focus obviously increases. Production, I mean, you could you could work on other things you've been thinking about. Like all I wanna do is work on my podcast, my YouTube channel. It's just been hard because of COVID because right. some people aren't willing to meet in person. Mm -hmm. You know, they're scared. Yeah. <laughs> We're not gonna get into that. No. Um <laughs> Is there, is there anything else that you think would be worthwhile to talk about um, regarding your practice? Well, one of the other cool things that, and this kind of fits into our whole paradigm, and like, so I treat musculoskeletal injuries in the office, but one of my other passions, and I've been kind of working on this in the background for a lot of years, is inflammation control. So inflammation is kind of the root of a lot of chronic disease that we see, mm. diabetes, heart disease, um, obesity is all controlled by inflammation. Um, and not surprisingly, that's a big component of chronic injuries. Just like we talked about the mental health. Um, yeah, we do have to do a lot of mental health with chronic injuries because after you've had an injury for so long, it almost becomes a part of you. Yeah. And so you set these limitations on yourself um, and they might be real or they might be imagined, but you create stories about your life or your injury based on what you've been feeling. Yeah. Um, so chronic pain has a huge emotional com component, mental. Um, so that's one of the things that kind of sprouted out inadvertently with it. Um, and I guess probably where we've done some a little bit more of that training, just like through books and kind of awareness of stuff. But also um, the other component that's really big with chronic injuries is inflammation. Yeah. So that in inflammatory response is actually a good thing short term, but when it becomes chronic, low grade, and then it continues to increase, increase, that can drive a lot of chronic pain symptoms even after we've restored the tissue function. So people, we kind of were running into a little bit of a dead end where people would have these great ranges of motion, they're moving so much better, they feel better, but they're like, but it's not all gone. And it's like, okay, that's when we started to sit down and be like, um, we had you know, already addressed a lot of the lifestyle components as far as like sitting and workouts and water, but then you have to start looking at other layers that can cause inflammation um, and a lot of that is rooted in gut health. Yeah. So gut health is a huge new thing. Um, so my journey with that started like probably six, seven, eight years ago. Um, so transitioning out of uh, chiropractic school, paleo was like the new thing. Um, so I, you know, converted a little bit to paleo, learned a lot about like how some things were just more so in our bodies as far as like, you know, modern day foods. And I think paleo as an approach is fine because it's, as long as you're not eating like all these paleo treats, like and thinking that oh, paleo is fine. Um, but the, the approach of, you know, go around, eat, you know, prioritize, uh, protein and fats add some veggies in, like as a um, grassroots effort, I think paleo is like a smart whole foods approach. Mm. Now people can take it obviously a lot of different ways. So I had done paleo and um, transitioned myself into taking probiotics. Well, because of the gut, you know, gut health things. Well, somewhere along the way, probably about two, probably two or three years into eating that way, and not strictly, but as the, the curriculum or the base of my diet, um, I started getting eczema on my hands. And I was like, where did this come from? And so I tried all the natural hippie stuff to get rid of it. Coconut oil, you know, this is, you know, seven, <laughs> year, seven years ago when there wasn't a lot of like natural care products on the mm -hmm. market that were effective and safe. So there's a lot of products, and that's a whole nother um, ball of wax, that are on the uh, market that aren't safe for us really. They have adverse effects to our hormones and um, endocrine system and cancer causing too. Um, so... I had fought, you know, to avoid going to doctors, finally gave in, went to a DO, they gave me a steroid cream to put on top of the eczema because it was embarrassing to be yeah. in the office, people are looking at my hands all day and like, what is that? Is that contagious? No, it's not. <laughs> it's just dry skin. But it was, you know, I was very self-conscious about it. And so I went there and she's like, oh, well, it could be caused by stress, temperature change, um, alcohol, like pretty much everything under the sun can, you know, 
whatever is in your cleaning products, whatever is in your um, laundry care. How about your body soap? Where do I start? Your shampoo. Right. I was like, uh, okay. That's too much information. Right. And I told her I've been using essential oils on it, and she's like, oh, that's not really effective. Like, kind of like one of those things where, you know, you get the little, like, don't do that. Yeah. And I was like, that just really irritates me because, like, you giving me a steroid cream is not solving my problem. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, where... Where did this come from? Because I haven't ever had this before, and I'm 25, and it just came up out of nowhere. Like I don't, I'm not buying that. So um, I started looking into like what could cause eczema, and people were saying like gluten and dairy could. So I did some detoxes: no gluten, no dairy, no gluten and dairy. Um, that kind of led my way into a whole 30. Um, and from there, like, I ended up finding out that a lot of my eczema uh, symptoms were from gut-based problems. Really? Yes. Wow. So I got rid of my own eczema, like, by going through these different kinds of um, restrictions in my diet to, yeah. like, clean up the gut health. Um, because our skin is an expression of a lot of internal things, like mm. acne, dry skin, even, like, that chicken skin people get, you know, yeah. guitar, uh, came from what's called, a. Uh, Something with a K. Um, but anyway, a lot of that is uh, like external um, external showing of internal dysfunction. Yeah. Um, our skin is, is a detoxifier. So as, as far as surface area, it's actually our biggest organ. So a lot of things you can see on the skin are based off the internal stuff. Here and over there, I really got into gut health. I did some Whole30s if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Um, whole 30 is just like trying to take everything that's inflammatory as far as foods out of your diet and then reintroducing them bit by bit to see what you're reacting to. Yeah. Um, so I've done I can't, like uh, three or four of those. And then there's this really cool test that actually I made your mom do. Um, it's called a biome. And so it's a gut health test. What it does is it goes in and it looks at your bacteria. And then based on published research, research and the function of the bacteria, it will tell you which foods to avoid, which foods to eat in plenty, and it will help balance your gut bacteria. Um, and your gut is kind of like the interface from your inside and outside world. So it's kind of like, if you think about your gut, it should be from your mouth to your butt. It should yeah. be a tube yeah. that only lets things through selectively. And that's advantageous because it will or won't let no nutrients through um, bacteria, viruses that come in through your mouth. I mean, like we have all these protective layers that are set up to avoid, you know, disease and keep us healthy. Um, but over time, that barrier can be eroded from stress, antibiotic use, um, eating a nutrient um, poor diet, such as you know, high sugar, high processed fats, mm -hmm. um, and like so, a lot of things can disrupt this barrier. And then once that's once that's disrupted, you can get things through to your body that shouldn't. And then that will create outward expressions. So it's just like, that's kind of like my next thing is that I've, you know, been in the trenches with that on my own before some of this information was available yeah. more readily. Um, so that's, that's another program I'm kind of working on to help people manage inflammation through a gut-based approach, but also lifestyle, making sure they're drinking enough water, make sure that you're moving enough, make sure that um, you're doing some stress management techniques, yeah. uh, like a gratitude journal, or um, diaphragmatic breathing, all that stuff. So it's kind of like a, I'm working on like an evergreen style program where people could sign up for a six week program and I would kind of take you through day by day what you need to be doing to kind of switch some of those things. So this is separate from peak <laughs> yeah. injury solutions. It's, um, it's kind of like, it's a continuation of it because we just found that people weren't getting better because of this elephant in the room, which was inflammation and it's lifestyle. Yeah. So in order to get people over that hump where they ha you know, went from like eight out of 10 pain to like two or three out of 10 pain, they're like, it feels so much better, but I want this gone. Yeah. Okay, well these are the other things you need to do. Like there's nothing left in the tissue that we need to repair. It's everything else in your life that's that still driving some of that. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the next thing, the, my next big project that I'm working on is creating a program that um, is individualized enough that it can help people, but not a lot of me one-on-one. Because -on -one. I've done some, uh, you know, a handful um, of one-on-one -on -one clients right now, but that's, you know, time prohibitive because I'm trying to see patients and I'm trying yeah, to do this. Yeah, it's a lot to juggle. Right, so, but it all kind of fits into this big conglomeration. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
that's the coolest thing is like gut health. It's kind of the foundation for. Did you say this is a test that they take and then it kind of determines? Because my mom was telling me, you right. know, it determines what foods you she can eat. and can't eat or should yeah. have less of. And she's like, she's looking at the list and she's like, I I rely on these things, right. you know. And the cool thing is, um, and I explained this to her, is that your gut is kind of like a garden. Like certain, like certain. Um, you have to have certain uh, variability in it. Yes. If yeah. you fertilize your garden with the same things over and over again, some stuff's going to thrive and some stuff's going to die off. Mm -hmm. But if you want everything to thrive, you have to create more variety in your gut. <clears throat> and that's why this test is so cool is because I've done these restrictive diets before where I would cut out entire food groups. And that biome, <clears throat> sorry, that biome allows you to be more selective about what you have to avoid and what you need to consume. So you're not like literally down to eating nothing because yeah. that's how sometimes, you know, I, I never felt like this myself, but I've had clients that are like, you know, had went vegan because, um, she like, I couldn't eat protein. Well, we did this test and it shows she needs, um, enzymes that break down protein. So she was right. Her body was telling her this, like these right things, like protein would not digest in her stomach. She'd feel sick afterwards. And so like she had started avoiding it because she couldn't break it down. And then you do this test and it's like, well, it makes sense why you would avoid meat. Your body's telling you it can't process it, but you're not making that connection because you don't understand. Yeah. So that's so weird because, like, in talking about Jordan Peterson, I don't know, you know, his daughter Michaela Peterson, yeah. and then him too. They do the all carnivore diet. Right. They've suffered with like depression and whatnot. She had chronic like inflammation in her joints. Yeah, and juvenile arthritis. Yeah, is and, awful. And by doing finally getting, I don't know if they still do all carnivore, but it eliminated Michaela a lot. Michaela does. Michaela, yeah. Um, that's that's crazy because that well that's another new uh, diet that's like kind of come to the forefront. You hear like intermittent fasting, yeah. and then now we got all carnivore. So I I think it's good to try them all out and just see what works best for you. Well, and that's the beauty of this biome test is it it gets you closer than any other test that I've seen before gets you to like where you should and should what food you should avoid and shouldn't yeah. because it's very customized to your gut bacteria. It's not like the, oh this is a cold poop test or his diet like this is all cool eats all day you should try it <laughs> i i eat a lot of the same things so i, I have no idea to switch it up right yeah so that's the the beauty <laughs> of that um carnivore i will say my husband's done, done a lot of research into this um and i don't know the um book he listened to i'm pretty sure it's an md that is proponent of this carnivore diet that he wrote a whole book about the reason why plant-based um sources of energy are like they have protective mechanisms in them themselves mm -hmm. and so they'll create reactions in the gut and so like the true elimination diet is a carnivore diet that's his premise so my husband's trying it out with um on this modified carnivore you can still do cucumbers um avocados and green leafy lettuces olives and then um i think maybe some, some sourdough because it's yeah you know like a Natural yeast. He's on that right now. He's um, doing kind of like a modified oh, version of okay. it. So he's also a big intermittent faster. That's yeah. how he actually lost about eighty pounds is Dang. doing intermittent fasting. Yeah. Um, and you know, came from the same background where he was like feeling so inflamed and had a lot of musculoskeletal issues. And someone finally said to him, like, "You got to lose some of that weight because you're just carrying around too much mass." Yeah. And you know, he was eating a bunch of bullshit foods. You know, mm -hmm. so. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that there is no one size fits all. And that's why I like that test so much because it's based on your own gut bacteria. So your you like, even between you and your brother who have a lot of the same genetic makeup, you would get back completely different food tests and right. you should because crazy. you have different life experiences. You have a different diet than him. You, you know, are in contact with different environments. Yeah. Him. So that's why I think that's such a cool test. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Um, well, we're kind of over time yeah. limit here now. Danny, thanks for coming on. Yeah. I appreciate it. Of you course. shared a lot of knowledgeable information. I mean, we might have to do a part two podcast. I All think right. there's way more we could dive into. All right. Maybe with my husband on here too. That would be cool too. He'll talk. He can do a... Uh, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. You're talking about Jordan Peterson. Yeah, exactly. All that good jazz. Yep. All right. Thanks, Danny. Uh -huh.